Welcome everybody to today's special year seminar on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. Today we are pleased to have Jeffrey Negria as our speaker. Jeff is a PhD candidate and Vanier scholar at the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute, where he is co-advised by Daniel Roy and Jeffrey Rosenthal. His research interests include statistical learning theory, Monte Carlo methods, or recently online learning. Today, Jeff will tell us about the new setting for sequential prediction with expert advice that relaxes the ID assumption. Please welcome Jeffrey and Edward. Thank you very much. Uh, so the work I'm going to tell you about today is joint work with Blair Bilodeau and Daniel Roy. Uh, and let's just get started. So we'll start with a bit of an example to motivate uh, the work we're going to talk about. And it's going to be an analogy to the stock market. So you have some money, hopefully, that you want to invest into a stock portfolio. And you'll have access to several market experts that are going to give you some advice on what you should do with your money. And at the end of the year, you're going to have made maybe a thousand less dollars than if you had followed Alice, one of your experts' advice. And you'll have some remorse that you didn't follow her advice for the whole year and have an extra thousand dollars in your pocket. And so we characterize that as having a remorse for having not always followed the post hoc best experts advice. And if we're going to uh, make predictions about the market in order to, to form our portfolio in a way that hopefully does well in this scenario, uh, in order to come up with our strategy, we're gonna make some assumptions uh, that our strategy will hopefully do well relative to. And what assumptions should we make? Should we assume that the data that we're going to encounter will be IID? Is it appropriate to assume that the data will be adversarial? Or maybe neither of these assumptions are reasonable uh, for the problem you'll have at hand. And a simplifying assumption is always going to be that the data are IID because it affords you certain convenient tools like concentration of measure and the like. But in real life, the market is not going to be driven entirely by stochastic forces. There's going to be some non-stochastic uh, things that go on in the world. And so uh, at the same time, though, assuming that the data is actually adversarial may be too pessimistic because you may not be important enough for the entire market to specifically target you to do poorly. And so we want to know if the departure from IIDness is going to be benign if we're going to use an IID model. And we need to quantify what it means for that to be benign. And if the influence of the non-stochastic forces in the world is small, then maybe the departure from IIDness will be benign and a IID model might be useful, but the meaning of small is not really clearly defined and that's something we're gonna talk about today. And regardless of all of this, what you really want is to maximize your profit without actually having to know what drives the market or how far from IID the real world happens to be. So in traditional statistical learning, we work in the IID framework where we receive a batch of training data and we estimate some prediction function based on the training data. And the IID assumption affords us this uh, fact that the performance on the training data will be ind indicative of the performance in the future if the data was really IID. But this has the limitation that the real data may not actually be IID. And so it's, uh, and even if it is, it might be impossible to verify whether it is or not. And so statistical analyses may use alternative explicit assumptions, for example, the Markov property or stationarity or a specific covariance structure in order to get around this. But these assumptions may be uncheckable or false as well. And the predictive performance of the model that we actually end up using will be uh, sensitive to the level of model misspecification. And what we really want is our predictions to be robust to the IID assumption, sort of no matter how it happened to fail. So again, in statistical learning, the performance will be measured uh, against the best predictor for the actual data generating distribution, even if we don't know what that is. And we'll be able to have guarantees about the future given the past. And these guarantees are entirely based on that IID assumption. Without assuming that the data are IID or stationary or so on, the best predictor in the class may not be clearly defined, and the past performance may no longer be a guarantee of future results. 
what can we do? We still want to be able to learn or make reasonable predictions. And so what we can do is uh, if we sequentialize the problem by making one prediction at a time, and if we move the goalposts from an absolute notion of performance to a relative one, then we can still learn in the absence of the IID assumption. And this leads us to sequential prediction with expert advice, which is the problem we're going to be studying in this talk. Uh, so sequential prediction or online learning uh, considers a number of rounds from 1 to t, uh, where at each time we're going to make a prediction y hat of t based on the historical data up until that time. And then you'll observe some data from the environment. And you'll incur a loss depending on how appropriate your prediction was relative to the data the environment actually produced. And the component here of expert advice says that before you make your prediction at time t, you get to observe the actions of some experts. And your aim is to perform well relative to the best among these experts. We can visualize uh, the flow of information over time in this process uh, with the following diagram. So at time one, the experts will lock in their first set of predictions and you get to look at those predictions in order to make your prediction as the player. Separately, the environment generates the first data point and that's compared to your prediction in order to give you your first loss. All of this is put together into the history up until time one. And then at time two, the experts will look at the history up to the end of time one to formulate their second prediction you'll look at the expert predictions at time two, as well as the full history, and you'll make your prediction at time two. And separately, the environment looks at the history and formulates the second data point, which is then compared to your prediction to give you your second loss. And this all becomes the history up to the end of time two, and this process repeats at time three, and so on. So the player is using historical data to produce a prediction at each time, and the measure of the player's performance is going to be relative to a class of reference experts. We'll just enumerate them from 1 to n. Uh, and it's going to be given by the excess cumulative loss of the player over the best expert. And this is called the regret. So the regret up to time t, as I alluded, is going to be the cumulative loss of the player, which is the first expression on the right hand side, less the cumulative loss of the best expert, which is the second expression on the right hand side. And here, y hat i of t denotes the prediction made by expert i at time t. So the, predict, the prediction problem is online learnable when you can incur sublinear regret. And the reason it's important to incur sublinear regret is if you just made arbitrary predictions and the losses took values in the interval 0, 1, you could always ensure that you incur linear regret. And so incurring linear regret is not interesting. Uh, as soon as you get sublinear regret, you're doing something more interesting than making arbitrary predictions. And this expectation and the expected regret is taken with respect to the randomness in the player and experts' predictions, as well as the environment's mechanism by which the data are generated. And so this expectation may be some complicated non-IID measure because it involves all the different interactions of the player, the expert, and the environment. So Jeff, we have a question from Alan Chan. Um, the question is, do you get to see all of the experts' predictions, or do you have to pick which expert's prediction to look at at time t? Um, so the way we formulated the problem here, we get to see what their actual predictions are. Uh, in principle, you don't necessarily need to see their predictions. You end up, um, the strategies we end up using will, end up, will be proper, which means that we're just going to pick the name of an expert according to some distribution and then choose to mimic them. So uh, in that sense, you don't need to know what their actual predictions were, uh, but it doesn't make a difference either way in terms of what the minimax optimal regret is for the problem. Thank you. Okay, so now we want to know what the optimal regret that we can achieve in the stochastic case and the adversarial case uh, are. What we're interested in is how well can we do in terms of regret if our data is IID? What if it's adversarial? How well can we do? And can we adapt between these two settings? And what adapt means here is we don't want to know which universe we're in, IID or adversarial, before the game starts. We want to have the best possible performance relative to the universe that we're in without knowing what that actually is. 
So the IID, uh, or more specifically stochastic with a gap setting, is characterized by expert predictions and data, which are IID over time from some fixed distribution, and that there's an expert whose mean loss is uh, smaller by an amount delta than all the other experts. And in this stochastic with a gap setting, it's possible to have a uniformly bounded regret over time. And the uniform bound on the regret is the log number of experts over delta times some universal constant. Uh, and so what's interesting about this is that it's uniform in time. So after you essentially only incur a finite amount of regret, which is very sublinear. Uh, and it's a very fast uh, or a very slow increase in the regret or a very fast amount of learning. And at the other end of the spectrum from the stochastic with a gap setting, we have the fully adversarial uh, regime where we compete against expert predictions and data with that, that are generated with the aim of maximizing our regret. So it's well known that in the adversarial regime for the full information uh, prediction with expert advice problem that we're looking at, the expected regret up to time t is on the order of root t log number of experts uh, for all time. And so there's some universal constant that uh, is above this and there's uh, adversarial uh, strategies that make you incur also at least this much regret. But what's really like the ultimate question that we wanna answer is, there, is whether there exists a single policy that's optimal in both of these settings simultaneously. So you don't want to know what setting you're in. You want to have one algorithm that you run that does well relative to whatever world you're in without knowing what it is. So there's some work on this before ours. Uh, so we'll take a quick look at some of the existing work on stochastic and adversarial optimal policies. And it's very well studied in the bandit literature. So the bandit literature is a little bit different than what we've considered here. In the bandit literature, you can only see uh, the prediction or the loss of the expert that you choose to mimic. Uh, and the setting that we're considering, you can see all of the experts' predictions, even the ones you did not choose to mimic but it's good to understand uh, what exists in both sides of the literature. So in the bandits case, there's several uh, adaptive algorithms. There's SAO and the EXP3++, which are both based on hedge or the exponential weights algorithm, which looks like a Bayes rule, but we'll get back to that later. Uh, and it adds extra exploration to overcome the partial information from the bandit setting. And SAO, uh, I think of as adapting using an online hypothesis test, which it uses, uses to switch between uh, an algorithm that would be good in the adaptive, uh, sorry, in the adversarial case versus one that would be good in the stochastic case. And EXP3++ instead dynamically modifies the exploration terms to ensure adaptivity. At least that's my understanding of it. And then there's this other algorithm that's quite different than those two called the one half Talus inf algorithm, which was, uh, which was shown to be adaptively optimal uh, only last year, I guess. Um, and it's a follow the regularized leader strategy. Uh, and because it's follow the regularized leader, there's some regularizer in there. And the regularizer in this case is sort of perfectly balanced. And what perfectly balanced here means is that it gives you both sufficient exploration and full adaptivity built directly into the regularizer. In the full information case, the problem is a little bit less studied, uh, but hedge was recently shown to be optimal in both settings. And uh, three of these algorithms, hedge, exp3++, and Salus inf, all rely on implicit identification of which setting you're in, stochastic or adversarial rather than an explicit policy change as in SAO. So let's look at what the simultaneous optimality of hedge looks like for the full information setting. In the stochastic with a gap case, we know that we expect the regret to be bounded uniformly in time, but we'll incur some finite amount of regret that looks like log n over delta. And in the adversarial case, we expect the regret to grow like square root t log n over time. And so we can run a simulation where we uh, use the same uh, algorithm, which is hedge, for both of those settings. And we see that in the adversarial case, we indeed get the square root uh, t log n growth of the regret, while in the stochastic case, we have a finite amount of regret. And we also see something interesting here, that in the stochastic case, 
The regret tracks the adversarial regime's regret up until some kind of, it looks like a change point in the graph, up until some point in time where implicitly the algorithm has identified what the one best expert is. And after this, the amount of regret incurred thereafter increases very, very slowly so that it's summable and not even noticeable on this graph. So what we're interested in in this talk is going beyond stochastic and adversarial because the real data we encounter in the world may not be stochastic and that might be too optimistic of an assumption and it may not be adversarial, which may also be too pessimistic of an assumption. So what we want is to provide a spectrum between stochastic and adversarial. And we can think of this intuitively as blowing up a neighborhood around some unknown distribution and each data point will be drawn from an arbitrary distribution in that neighborhood. And we can illustrate this. So here the triangles represent the space of probability measures. And in the stochastic case, each data point is generated from the same probability measure, which is why it just looks like a straight line through the same point at all times. So you generate the first uh, data point from the same distribution as the second data point and so on. And that gives you an IID sequence. And in the adversarial case, we see that the distribution that generates the data is changing over time. And moreover, it's being selected from the extreme points of the space of probability measures. So you can think of the point masses as the extreme points of the space of probability measures. And we may think of adversarial data as being deterministic instead of stochastic, but we can also think of that as being generated from uh, the extreme points of the set of measures. And so that's kind of what we see in the adversarial case in this image. And then finally, in our intermediate scenario, we could think of any sort of green disk that uh, could have been put in this space of probability measures and the data at each point in time will be generated from a different point within the green disk. So it's more constrained than the adversarial case, but less constrained than the stochastic case. And uh, for a very small disk, it looks almost like the stochastic case and can be thought of as a slight relaxation of IIDness. And we can kind of continuously relax IIDness as we increase the size of that disk. So kind of a, a preview of what we show in our work. So first we show a negative result that hedge is actually suboptimal between stochastic and adversarial. So even though it did very well at the endpoints, it does not always do well in between. This was surprising for us. Uh, we actually initially set out on this project hoping to prove that that hedge will be adaptive to all scenarios in between. And uh, the reason that we thought that would be intuitive is if it's adaptive perfectly to both of the endpoints because IID is one extreme on the spectrum and adversarial is another extreme, it would make intuitive sense that it would do well in between the extremes as well. It does not. So without Oracle knowledge of the constraint set or that green disk without knowing that in advance, you can't tune hedge to make it minimax optimal at uh, some settings between stochastic with a gap and adversarial. So uh, based on what we learned when analyzing hedge in this uh, kind of intermediate regime, we provide a new policy that is minimax optimal for all scenarios on the spectrum. And it's uh, minimax optimal without knowledge of which scenario prevails, meaning that it's fully adaptive. And it achieves this by tuning the learning rate of hedge based on like an implicitly defined number of effective experts. And we'll see what that means later in the talk. And so our positive result is that there is an adaptive minimax optimal policy and we've named it Medicare. So in order to show you what the regret accumulation of Medicare looks like, we need some motivating intuition for what we expect the minimax regret to actually look like in these intermediate settings. In the adversarial case, the minimax optimal regret is known to be root t log n. So if we knew that only a smaller collection of the experts could ever be the best, and we knew which ones they were, let's call them the effective experts, then we could restrict an adversarial optimal strategy to only play the, these best experts or the effective experts. So then we might strive to have a regret that's on the order of root t log number of effective experts. So it looks like we're only competing with the good experts. We don't have to pay uh, for the extra regret necessary to compete with the bad experts. On the other hand, 
if we knew that there's exactly one expert that's always better than the rest and it's better by an amount like a fixed gap delta naught but we didn't know which expert that is then we're almost in the stochastic with a gap case and so we might hope for a regret that's on the order of log n over the gap which mirrors the stochastic with a gap uh, best possible regret so we also want to know what the notion of gap is in between the uh, one effective expert and multiple effective expert case. And so we provide a definition of this, which is essentially uh, just trying to generalize the one effective expert definition to the multiple uh, possible best experts case. And it says that delta naught will be the gap from the, the smallest possible gap from one of the best experts to a bad expert on a round. And so what we find is that there is in fact an explicit policy that achieves expected regret uh, that has this form. And so we'll break down the three different terms here. First, in the case of one effective expert, the first term out here is just zero because the log of one is zero. And so the only term that prevails is this term here, which is exactly what we would have hoped based on the second bullet. Uh, we're almost in the stochastic with a gap setting so we can incur regret uh, expected regret that looks like the stochastic with a gap setting. And now if there's more than one effective expert, we, we're able to accumulate regret in the long run uh, based on what we had hoped we would be able to achieve if we knew what the best experts were in advance. And in order to learn what those best experts are, kind of similar to how this term was seen to behave from the plot of hedge on a few slides uh, previous, we incur some kind of burn and regret from learning who the best experts are in the two or more best experts case. And that's given by this term here. So in the long run, we uh, learn as though we knew the best experts in advance. And in the short run, we have to pay some extra regret to do that learning. And we're able to get this adaptive regret bound uh, without any oracle knowledge of the time horizon, the number of effective experts, the size of the gap, or what the set of experts which could possibly be the best are. So this is fully adaptive. You don't need to know what universe you live in. You're always going to get the best possible regret relative to that universe, as though you had known it in advance. So let's take a look at the hedge algorithm and the existing regret bounds for the hedge algorithm. We're gonna consider only finite expert classes and bounded losses, and the losses will take values in the interval zero, one. And all explicit policies we consider will be proper, meaning that the player will randomly select an expert to mimic at each time. And the probability assigned to expert i at time t under some proper policy will be denoted by wi of t. And because there's a minimax optimal policy that happens to be proper, we don't lose anything uh, from assuming that we're gonna play a proper policy. And so hedge is the proper policy that's defined in the following way. There's some learning rate schedule that takes the natural numbers which represent different times in the game uh, to the real numbers. And it has an initial weight vector which is uniform. And then if we define li of t to be the loss of expert i at time t and capital li of t to be the cumulative loss of expert i up to time t, then the weights for hedge are chosen to be proportional to the exponential of the negative learning rate times the loss at the, the cumulative loss up to the previous round. And when you, when you take the learning rate to be constant in time, this looks just like a Bayes rule for an expert valued parameter where you have a flat prior and the likelihood is the exponential of the negative uh, loss at time i, or loss of expert i at time t for the teeth observation under parameter i. So uh, among other regret bounds of this flavor, uh, Chesa, Bianchi, and Lugosi show that if you take your learning rate to uh, be like log n, square root of log n over t, so it's decreasing like one over root t and uh, is kind of scaled up to the number of experts, then you can have expected regret. That's the minimax optimal rate. And it's minimax optimal because we have a matching lower bound. That means that uh, there are prediction problems such that no player policy, even one that was not proper, could do better. 
And then similarly, in the stochastic with a gap setting, so our loss vectors end up being IID from some distribution since the expert predictions and the data were IID. Uh, if we let I star denote the best expert and delta denote the gap from the second best expert's uh, mean loss to the best expert's mean loss, then Mortada and Guyfish showed that last, showed last year that hedge again with learning rate that's like root log n over t uh, achieves the good regret, uh, the good kind of constant bound on regret that looks like log n over delta. And they show that there's a matching lower bound. So uh, there exists a prediction problem where uh, the losses are IID and you can't actually get lower regret than this with any strategy. So before we move on to our uh, scale or our spectrum between uh, stochastic and adversarial, we're gonna take a look at some notions of easiness in online learning. And this is not a comprehensive list, but we'll just take a look at a few things here. So the stochastic with a gap adversarial in the spectrum that we introduced between them can be thought of as grades of easiness in sequential prediction, where stochastic with a gap is sort of the easier side, adversarial is the harder side, and the spectrum we introduce is sort of scaling the difficulty from very easy to very hard. And there's other notions of easiness that have been introduced. So work on first order bounds controls regret in terms of the sum of the observed losses. And so in that type of work, easiness is characterized by the existence of an ex expert with low cumulative loss, which spuriously suggests that regret is not invariant to shifts in the losses. Uh, second order bounds improve upon first order bounds uh, by controlling the regret in terms of the variability of the losses instead. And so easiness is characterized by low empirical variance in the loss. We derive such bounds as intermediate results in our work, but there's a, quite an extensive literature that also works on second order bounds specifically. And another piece of work by Rockland, uh, but another piece of work introduces uh, constrained adversaries where easiness can be characterized by the nature of the constraint. And our work is uh, kind of a refinement of that idea for prediction with expert advice. And we provide further characterization of the constraint sets involved. And so our analyses results and interpretations are new, but the framework builds upon this previous work. So now we can get to our specific relaxations of the IID assumption. And so let's start with a bit of the intuition behind it. We want the expert prediction and the data to be jointly selected from some adversarially chosen conditional distribution, uh, which is kind of mimicking what we drew in that picture with the triangles earlier in the talk. So formally, we're gonna fix some convex set of distributions among the set of all distributions on expert predictions and data. And we're going to have the, the new expert predictions and new data at time t drawn from some element of, of this constraint set given the prior history up to time t. So we call this time homogeneous because the constraint set does not vary with time. And the convexity here is essentially the same as allowing the environment to use randomness to select between basic elements of the constraint set, which is very natural if you think of uh, kind of mixed strategies in games or just that there's no reason that if I can select uh, distribution A and distribution B that I should not be allowed to flip a coin to make that selection. And the environment may aim to maximize the player's regret subject to the constraint on the environment. So the distribution choice made by the environment can be based on the outcome of the previous rounds and if we didn't allow that, if the environment had to select all of their uh, distributions where the data will be drawn from beforehand, it would be called oblivious. We consider non-oblivious environments, which obviously form a larger class than oblivious environments. And we consider the mechanism that selects a distribution from the constraint set at each time as the environment's policy. And this is sort of dual to the player's policy uh, for learning in this game. So the player aims to control the worst case expected regret over all possible policies for the constrained environment. 
So let's look at an exam at several examples of these constraint sets. The most simple example is if the constraint set was a singleton, so there's only one distribution, and that gives rise to IID data because at every point in time, the next distribution will be the same uh, as the previous, and so we'll end up with the same distribution being used to select each data point, and so the data sequence will be IID. Then the adversarial regime uh, is kind of the opposite, but almost as simple, where we take the distribution uh, constraint set to be the set of all possible measures on expert predictions and uh, data. And this gives us the adversarial case because it contains all the point masses and all the ways to flip coins to select between point masses. Now getting a little bit more structured, we can consider the adversarial with a gap setting. This is where one expert has at least delta less loss than every other expert on every round. And so we can think of this as the convex hull of point masses, uh, which happen to satisfy the gap constraint. Or equivalently, we can think of the constraint set as all measures satisfying the gap constraint almost surely. Another constraint set which relaxes the previous is the adversarial with an expectation gap. So one expert has at least delta less loss in expectation than every other expert on every round. And so this contains the adversarial with a gap as a subset. So again, we think of the constraint set as a collection, or we think of the setting as a collection of measures that the environment can select from. And so the collection of measures in the adversarial with a gap setting is a subset of that from the adversarial with an expected gap. And something new to this work that we can consider is neighborhood of IID. And so if we fix a, a metric on the space of distributions, and we pick some distribution uh, in that space, then we can let the constraint set be any neighborhood, any convex neighborhood of that initial distribution. Namely, it could be a ball of some radius around that distribution. And if we make the radius of the ball very small, then we'll recover the stochastic case, specifically IID according to that initial distribution. And if we let the radius go to infinity, then we can recover the adversarial case. And we can smoothly transition between these two cases as we vary the radius of the ball. A small neighborhood can be thought of as a slight or a benign relaxation of IIDness, whereas a larger neighborhood might be some egregious uh, deviation from IIDness. So we're going to uh, use some quantities to quantify the effect of our constraint, which are going to be representative of whether the data is easy or not. And they're going to be independent of the policies involved, which means that they're going to depend only on the constraint set and not the policy of the environment or the policy of the player. And so they'll yield matching upper and lower bounds on the, on the minimax regret. So the first of these parameters we call the effective experts, and we've already hinted at this earlier in the talk. It's going to be the set of experts which are optimal in expectation for some measure in the constraint set. And then the number of effective experts is just the cardinality of that set. And this is analogous to the single best expert in the stochastic with a gap setting. And so it kind of generalizes this to when there might be more than one possible best. Then we have the effective stochastic gap, which is the second uh, quantifying parameter. And this is the minimum over all measures in the constraint set of the expected difference in loss from the best expert under that measure to the best ineffective expert. And this generalizes the gap from the stochastic with a gap setting. So let's take a look at an example of a constraint set, which we can use to kind of get a, an idea for what these parameters represent. So the setting is going to be characterized by having the mean uh, of the loss of each expert jointly defined by some real valued parameter alpha. And we're gonna have five experts in this example. And three of those experts will be effective experts, so possibly the best. And those will be experts one, three, and five. So here's our plot, uh, our illustration of what's going on. On the x-axis, we have the parameter alpha, uh, which varies which measure in the constraint set we're considering. And on the y-axis, we have the expected loss of each of the experts. 
So here, if we take a look at this blue curve that goes diagonally downwards, this represents how the mean of expert one, the mean of the loss of expert one varies with the parameter alpha. And if we look at this increasing red curve, it's uh, showing us how as we vary alpha, the mean expected loss, or sorry, the expected loss of expert four varies as we vary alpha. Okay. So you can tell from what I wrote down up here and also that I've colored these differently that one, three, and five will turn out to be the effective experts and two and four will turn out to be the ineffective experts. But first let's take a look at what happens if we draw a vertical slice at one value of the parameter alpha. So this is considering just one uh, measure in this constraint set. So that measure is mu alpha naught. And under that measure, we have the expected loss of expert one occurs at this point, at this height, uh, the expected loss of expert three over here, and so on. And so the stochastic gap, if we were considering uh, just IID from this one distribution, mu alpha naught, is going to be given by this distance here. But the effective stochastic gap uh, for this measure relative to the entire constraint set is going to be given by uh, this distance, which is a little bit larger. And that's because the effective stochastic gap compares the best effective expert to the best ineffective expert, as opposed to comparing between two effective experts, which is uh, what led to this smaller gap in the stochastic case under this uh, specific measure. So now if we look at all values of the parameter alpha, we can let this highlighted area trace out what the minimum uh, the, the expected loss of the best expert is at each value of alpha. So here on the left, we see that expert five is the best. And so this is the expected loss of expert five up until it is surpassed by expert three. And then expert three is the best until it's surpassed by expert one. And so this green curve is tracing out the expected loss of the best expert at each value of alpha. And so we find that the effective stochastic gap for the entire constraint set is given uh, by this vertical distance here, which is this kind of smallest distance ever between one of the red curves and the highlighted green area. So now let's think about the values of the number of effective experts and the gap for the various examples we talked about before. In the stochastic with a gap setting, we're gonna have a singleton constraint. And so because it's assumed to have a gap, it's part of the name, we're gonna have exactly one effective expert here. And we're going to have uh, the effective expert is the one with that uh, unique lowest expected loss. And so the effective stochastic gap will be the same as what we saw was the definition of the stochastic gap. And it's just the uh, difference in loss from the second best expert to the best expert. In the adversarial case, uh, we end up having that all of the experts are effective. So the number of effective experts is just the number of experts. And we have that the effective stochastic gap is positive infinity. And that's just because uh, by definition, it'll end up involving a min over an empty set. Now we get to the, to the cases with more rich structure. We have the adversarial with a gap setting. And uh, recall that that's where the data is chosen adversarially, but one expert is always uh, strictly better than the others by delta. And by construction, it has one effective expert and the effective stochastic gap is the gap from its original definition. And the same holds true for the adversarial with an expectation gap. So we can get now to the kind of newer to our work uh, type of constraint, which is the neighborhood of IID. So again, you pick some distribution and some radius and you consider the constraint set to be the ball around that distribution of the given radius. And if we suppose that our uh, initial distribution where we centered the ball had gaps between all the means and the losses, then the number of effective experts and the size of the gap will vary with the radius of the ball. And how does it vary with the radius of the ball? Well, first, the number of effective experts is going to be non-decreasing with a radius. There's going to be a transition point where you go from having one effective expert to two effective experts, and then a transition point from two to three, and so on. And it'll increase discreetly 
And we'll consider the reciprocal of the stochastic gap, which is what these blue curves are tracing out. And we see that the reciprocal stochastic gap is going to increase between the jumps in the number of effective experts. And it's going to, re it's going to reset every time the number of effective experts increases. And the reason for that is when an expert transitions from being uh, ineffective to being effective, it's no longer there to witness a small stochastic gap. And so it'll, uh, the next worst expert or the, the next best ineffective expert will jump farther away to where the next expert's losses happen to be in expectation. So we see that the lexicographical order on the number of effective experts and the reciprocal stochastic gap respects the subset operator for nested constraint sets. And so obviously nested constraint sets will have the property that the larger constraint will be harder to compete with. If the adversary or the environment has more choices, then it could always uh, make it more difficult for you to perform well. And so we can think of the number of effective experts and the reciprocal stochastic gap as quantifying the difficulty of our constraint set. So now under these constraint sets, let's analyze the performance of the hedge algorithm. So we're going to consider playing hedge with a learning rate that's something over square root of t for some convex constraint set. And uh, we're going to at first pretend that we don't know what the constraint set is. So recall that the adversarial and stochastic optimal choice of c was something on the order of root log n. And that will give us in the uh, one effective expert case, exactly what we hope to get. We'll get the log n over delta naught when there's exactly one effective expert. But when there's two or more effective experts, we're accumulating regret as though we were competing uh, fully adversarially with all of the experts, which is much worse than what we had hoped for. We had hoped this would be n zero, not uh, n. And on the other hand, uh, we could take some learning rate, which is suboptimal in the stochastic and in the adversarial case. But if we took that learning rate, we have some sort of weak adaptation in between uh, when, when the number of effective experts is bigger than two. We see that uh, we get this log, n out, log of n naught outside of the square root. And that's a little bit better if log of n naught is much smaller than square root of log of n but it's not what we hope to achieve and it's not minimax optimal. And both of these upper bounds, uh, the terms involving T in both of these upper bounds, as well as this term in the N0 is one case, all have matching lower bounds. And so we know that, especially in this case, uh, Hedge is not able to optimally adapt. So now what if we had Oracle knowledge? So what if uh, somebody came and told us what the real value of the number of effective experts is? Then we could take our learning rate uh, based on the square root of the log number of effective experts. And then we would get something that looks like what we had hoped we'd be able to achieve. We get the square root of the log of the number of effective experts here. Of course, uh, when we actually run this algorithm, when we actually play this game, we don't think we're going to know the number of effective experts in advance. So this is kind of not actually implementable. In all three cases, though, we can interpret the term involving t as uh, representing the long run accumulation of regret after you've adapted to the number of effective experts, if you adapt at all. And the term involving log n and delta effective or the effective stochastic gap as the adversarial regret that you incur over an adaptation period of uh, this duration. And this is exactly kind of what we saw in the, uh, in, the, in the simulation of hedge in both the stochastic and adversarial cases. In the stochastic case, we saw that we accumulated adversarial regret over some period, and we can characterize the duration of that period in this way. So can we do better than hedge? If we don't know what the number of effective experts is, can we learn adaptively and minimax optimally? In particular, is there a policy for which the time and number of effective experts uh, dependence matches hedge with Oracle knowledge of the number of effective experts? That has number of experts and gap dependence that's optimal for the stochastic case when we have one effective expert. And 
doesn't need any information about the constraint on the environment or the adversary or on the number of effective experts or anything like that? And the answer is yes. We introduced two new policies in order to achieve this. The first policy, which we call follow the regularized leader with care, accomplishes items one and three, but not two. In particular, it has a slightly worse dependence on the number of experts in the case that there's one effective expert. And then we introduce a second strategy or second policy that we call Medicare that accomplishes all three of these by boosting FTRL care and hedge. So essentially, care, FTRL care does well in case one, uh, hedge does well in case two. So if we can combine these in a smart way, then we can do well in both of those cases. So what are our improved policies and the corresponding regret bounds? So first we'll start with some intuition for how we want to improve on hedge. There's three key insights here. The first is that uh, from the Oracle regret bound for hedge, we know that if we could have our learning rate be the root of the log number of effective experts over T, we would be in really good shape. And second, we know that the regret of hedge is intimately uh, related to the entropy of the weight vector it learns. And the entropy is this function given uh, in information theory. We also know that the worst case adversary will force the weights to concentrate on a uniform distribution over the effective expert set. And so the entropy of the weight vector will be the log number of effective experts in the long run. And so kind of what we might hope for is that we could just set our learning rate to be the square root of the entropy of the weight vector over time. And uh, that hopefully would give us the good per performance because uh, the entropy will look like log of n naught. And if it looked like log of n naught, then we would have the learning rate that gets us adaptivity without having to have known log of n naught in advance. And of course, this is an implicit equation because here the learning rate depends on the weight vector. But also, if we recall the definition of hedge, uh, the, the weight vector depends on the learning rate. And so this leads us to our, one of our new algorithms, which we call follow the regularized leader with care. So care stands for constraint adaptive root entropy regularization. Uh, so it turns out hedge has a similar uh, format as this, where you've replaced the square root of h here with h. Uh, but what this is, is a follow the regularized leader algorithm, which means that you're going to select your weight vector to try and minimize the, uh, be, to try and be the weight vector that would have minimized the historical losses. But you're going to do that subject to some penalty from deviating from a uniform weight vector. So this can be thought of as a penalty from deviating from a uniform weight vector. And uh, we can write hedge in this way where we would have not had square root over h, we would have just had h. And uh, so we're just introducing a new regularizer and we'll find that it has some great properties. Uh, so in particular, finding the argument of this over w is equivalent to solving the following system of equations. So it almost exactly gives us uh, what I had wrote, written down on the previous slide that we want the learning rate to be the square root of the entropy over t. And we want the weight vector to look like the hedge weights with this learning rate. And of course, it's an implicit system of equations. But in our paper, we show that this has a unique solution. And that unique solution has some nice properties. In particular, for any constraint set on the environment, the expected regret that you'll incur by playing FTRL care uh, is bounded by the square root of t times the number, sorry, square root of t times the log number of effective experts, plus some penalty for having to learn which experts happen to be effective. And this is incurred in a like adversarial way over a burn-in period, just like in the uh, case of hedge at, in the stochastic with a gap setting. And it's doing this without any input knowledge of what the constraint set is. Here you see that I can run this algorithm without needing to know anything about the constraint set and I always uh, end up satisfying this regret bound. So now FTRL care had minimax optimal dependence on time and the number of effective experts without having knowledge of what that number of effective experts was. But when there's only one effective expert, uh, 
It incurs a total regret that had a log n and the three halves over delta instead of log n over delta. And to be minimax optimal when the number of effective experts is one, we're going to do something to combine hedge and FTRL care so that when n0 is one, we can bring this three half down to a one. And we call this new algorithm MetaCare, and it's just going to treat the predictions of hedge and FTRL care as meta experts and then use hedge on these two meta experts. And so you'll incur the best of the two regrets plus some excess regret from having to meta learn between them. But it turns out this excess regret from meta learning will not affect the order of the bound in both the number of effective experts is one and the number of effective experts is bigger than one cases. And so we end up with the following regret bound for Medicare. Uh, for any possible constraint set without knowledge of that constraint set, we went over this once before, but just to reiterate, we have root t log number of effective experts, uh, which is the rate that we hope to have in t, no matter what n0 was. And then when n0 is one, we get the uh, stochastic regret, the, the uniform bound on the stochastic regret. And when n0 is bigger than or equal to two, then we have this slightly larger burn in regret instead. So just to summarize uh, what we've talked about today, uh, we've introduced a spectrum of relaxations of the IID assumption, which are indexed by time homogeneous convex constraints on the environment. And they allow us to interpolate between the pure stochastic and pure adversarial settings, because the data we may want to predict might not be purely stochastic or purely adversarial. And we want to know that we're going to do well in all intermediate scenarios without knowing what scenario we're in and with well-defined relative to what that scenario is. And we've characterized the difficulty of learning along this spectrum using these parameters, the number of effective experts and the size of the effective stochastic gap. And we derived regret bounds for hedge along this full spectrum from IID to adversarial. And this in, uh, these bounds were in terms of the constraint set. And they showed us that it requires oracle knowledge to get the minimax optimal dependence on the time horizon and the number of effective experts. And so hedge is not adaptively minimax optimal. And then we provided this new policy Medicare with its corresponding regret bounds, which adapts optimally to our full spectrum of relaxations of the IID assumption without any oracle knowledge of the number of effective experts, which is what we set out to do. Thank you, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Okay, let's thank Jeff for the very interesting talk. Any questions? Okay, uh, let me start with one question. Um, so you said you had a lower bounds, uh, uh, matching lower bounds uh, for the results. I was wondering if you can um, just describe the intuitions behind that. Um, uh, larger burn-in uh, for um, n0 and not e greater than or equal to 2. Sorry, uh, let me go back a, a little bit. Um, so for this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have matching lower bounds for the leading term. Uh, we don't have a uh, matching lower bound for this term. Uh, okay, I see. Okay, uh, any but then for large time horizons, it's this term that uh, dominates. Right. So do you think there's any hope of uh, improving that? So the dependence on the uh, log of n to the three quarter, um, I guess that would to the three. Um, three yeah, over. so I think it's plausible that uh, the best possible would have just this in all cases. Right. But I'm not certain. It, you have kind of a lot more things to learn as soon as you have having two effective experts to learn who both of them are is more complicated than learning that which uh, single effective expert is best. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not actually certain. We haven't found anything better. But again, uh, this term dominates uh, in, right. in the long run anyways. That's why we focused on uh, just matching it when n0 is one because this term disappears. So this becomes the leading term. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, maybe I'll ask another high level question. Um, do you think the um, 
time homogeneity uh, assumption here is uh, critical. Uh, so the time homogeneity assumption was critical for the analysis. Mm -hmm. um, without that assumption, uh, a, another plausible assumption maybe would be that uh, instead of having a fixed ball, you might have a ball that changes slowly over time. So maybe it's centered at the previous uh, distribution used at every time. That'll give you a totally different analysis and it'll be characterized possibly in terms of like how quickly uh, are these allowed to move and stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I mean the same within the same techniques. So like um, what's the because uh, couldn't you just center uh, your predictions on the previous like I, I'm not sure I'm seeing why. Yeah. Um, so uh, not be adapted. The exact technique that we use does not directly uh, adapt to that setting because it involves some kind of concentration of measure that says you'll be able to distinguish between the ones that are best and the ones that are not best after some uh, burn-in period. Mm -hmm. Essentially, even though the, the distribution is not IID, there is like a type of concentration of measure um, for any possible distrib any possible policy of the environment and any possible policy of the player, you still will end up with this separation between the good and the bad. Uh, but if the, the collection that are good and the collection that are bad changes over time as the ball moves, then the exact technique we use doesn't work, but there might be other techniques that are similar that could work. I see. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Hello, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, first, thank, thank you very much for, for this talk and uh, also for, for the organizers. I just have a very small contribution co concern actually going uh, away from the IAD setting. Uh, this is actually, I think, uh, quite familiar and popular in uh, the community of the current neural network. Is that what they assume is that you have a sequence actually of uh, of random variables that are IID. But then what they assume at each time t, what you have is that both the input and the output are the result of uh, uh, the sequences of these IID sequences up to time t. So what you get is a non-IID setting, but you have actually be, be behind that a um, a sequence of IAD random variables that are called innovations that generate both the input and the output. And uh, they call this a weak dependence uh, structure. And as you actually uh, alluded to actually in the last question, is that to achieve results of whatever you want, learnability or whatever, you have to assume a little bit more about this, uh, uh, how the input and the output are generated and they have you have to assume some type of uh, concentration or uh, lipschitzness uh, uh, depending on, on on this random variable so that actually you can get some results of convergence as we said but i understand that the, that the settings might be slightly different but there is something uh, that is similar which is uh, going away from from the iad setting which doesn't make sense for example if you are working with a time series or something like that that, 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 that was uh, to, to, to contribute. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Jeff again for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention as well. All right. Cool. Um, all right. Um, I guess I will leave this meeting open if there are any further questions. And uh, yeah, so I guess I'm going to sign off. Thank you. <laughs>
so if nobody has any other questions, I'm going to sign off. Uh, but you can always email me um, or uh, contact me. At, I guess email is probably the best way. You can always email me if you have questions about the paper. And we archived it recently. So you can also read uh, the first preprint of this work. It's out on archive. Thank you.